Well, Owen, thank you for joining me. In July, I'm going to start that over again. Hello, and thank you for joining me. In July 1832, President Andrew Jackson vetoed the bank renewal bill, preventing the recharting of the Bank of the United States. Believing the bank was unauthorized by the Constitution and concentrated too much economic power in the hands of a small moneyed elite. He stated, In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven and the fruits of superior industry, economy, and virtue, every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, and excessive privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. There are no necessary evils in government. Its evils exist only in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection, and as heaven does, it rains, showers its favors alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. For relief and deliverance, let us firmly rely on that kind providence which I am sure watches with peculiar care over the destinies of our republic and on the intelligence and wisdom of our countrymen through his abundant goodness and their patriotic devotion our liberty and union will be preserved and father god as we agree with president jackson that our relief and deliverance must come from you as you watch over with peculiar care the destinies of our republic, understanding that in your eyes every individual is of equal value, we ask that you help us to have wisdom to elect leaders who will remember those who have elected them, applying the same attention to both rich and poor alike, precisely as our Constitution and your will require. We ask this in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Today's scripture is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 27. Please follow along in your own Bible. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew 2, 27. Let us hear the word of God. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is the word of God. Thanks and praise be to God. I've titled today's message as a question, just for us, because as we read today's scripture, where Jesus himself defines the Sabbath, we would be asking how it is that the Sabbath is made for humanity, just for us. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we consider your word today, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us. And may these words of my mouth and this meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin our deliberation of the Sabbath being made for humanity by taking a look at what the Help Finder Study Bible has to say on the topic of rest which is the dominant theme of the Sabbath. God made us flesh and blood human beings. He set aside one full day of rest out of seven days at creation because he knew we would need it. Because Jesus was also fully human and lived in a human body, he understands what it means to be tired himself. He also understood the limitations of his disciples and took them away for regular breaks. Life is full and busy, and it must be balanced by regular attention 
to the health of our body and soul. Being overly tired is dangerous because it can keep us from thinking clearly and may cause us to do or say things we'll regret. But when it's impossible to get enough rest, our weariness is an opportunity to experience God's faithfulness. From his own example in Genesis to the promises of the New Testament, it is clear that God wants us to discover rest and refreshment for our body and soul. But what should we do? After all, I mean, who can afford to take time to rest with so much to do? Genesis 2 verse 2 tells us, On the seventh day God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. Now, why would the omnipotent God of the universe rest following his work of creation? Surely it wasn't because the Almighty was physically tired. The answer is that God, in ceasing from his work, called the rest holy. God knew that you and I would need to cease from our work, to care for our physical and spiritual needs. Work is good but it must be balanced by regular rest and attention to the health of our body and soul. Otherwise, we can miss the divine moments God sends our way. We all need to be certain to carve out regular times for worship and spiritual refreshment. If God saw rest from work as holy, how can we afford not to rest? So let me propose a question for each of us. Do we observe regular times for worship and spiritual refreshment? In Exodus 23, verse 12, we read, You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working. This gives your ox and your donkey a chance to rest. It also allows your slaves and the foreigners living among you to be refreshed. Now, obviously, most of us don't own an ox or a donkey, and most certainly we do not have slaves. But regular, consistent, weekly rest is still an important part of avoiding and recovering from burnout. We all need to be refreshed. And it doesn't have to be on a particular day, just one out of seven. In Psalm 23, verse 1 through 3, King David wants everyone to know, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Did you notice that? Our rest and restoration brings honor to God just as it did for the king. God wants to provide times of rest for each of us. Rest renews us mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, thus giving us more energy for the work ahead. Rest is not only a necessity, but also a gift from God we should gladly accept. The prophet Jeremiah reminds us what God has done for his people. For I have given rest to the weary and joy to the sorrowing. Jeremiah 31, 25. So let's ask, what will give us spiritual rest? In Psalm 91, verse 1, we read, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Most High. And in Exodus 33, verse 14, the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, the apostle records, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When we visit friends far away and spend the night with them, 
they're, they've prepared a room for us to make us comfortable, to help us rest. God does the same for all his children. When we come into his presence, he has prepared a place where we can feel safe and rest. At his place, in his presence. As we accept our Savior's offer, the burdens of the world are put into perspective and our cares will melt away. They should melt away. When we need to be refreshed spiritually, the best thing we can do is to go to the creator of rest and linger there with him. And while we may ask, why do we feel so tired so very often? In Nehemiah 4 verse 10, the prophet reports as the people are working to repair the walls of Jerusalem. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. Often we get tired when there is too much work and the job seems too big. We get tired when we have a long sickness and grow weary of it. Listen to poor Job. I too have been assigned months of futility, long and weary nights of misery, Job 7.3. In this hauntingly modern confession of overwhelming fatigue, pain, and despair, Job voices the deepest needs and longings of the human soul. His personal tragedies include the loss of his wealth, his family, and his health. He wakes up unrested, drags himself through the day, and falls into bed exhausted but unable to sleep. Job's suffering has led him to feel alienated from God and from other people. His wife and friends were certainly no comfort to him. When you have a chance, I highly recommend reading the whole of the book of Job. Here Job cries out to God in honest anguish, pleading for relief from his pain. When we become exhausted and feel that we cannot go on, this is when we need to take that first step toward healing and rest by pouring out all that we are feeling to the God of the universe. He wants to hear from us. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 27, we hear the Apostle Paul, I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. When we, like Paul, get tired as we are constantly lacking necessary resources, we need to remember Proverbs 23, verse 4 and 5, where we hear some great advice. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. We get tired when we're striving too hard for something that just isn't worth it. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies. Unfortunately, as we grow older, or face sickness or infirmity, we can grow weary of our failing bodies and long for the new bodies we will receive in heaven. When we get tired and we're feeling down, we need to remember that Christ's suffering on the cross revealed a Savior who walked every weary path of weakness or suffering that anyone has ever walked. His resurrection revealed a new life filled with the power of God. In our resurrected bodies, our human weakness will be set aside and we will share in the power and strength of Christ. However, even now, those who believe and follow Christ share in his resurrection power through his indwelling Holy Spirit. Let us never forget that. The God of all creation indwells each believer. In Psalm 40, verse 2, King David shares his confidence in God. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. You know, sometimes we forget what we've spoken of before. We have an enemy who is relentless, always looking to wear us down. 
Listen to 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. There are times when God will use our difficulties to strengthen our trust in him. Let's not get tired when we're depressed or discouraged, but instead remember what the prophet Isaiah told the faithful. Listen, God has told his people that would be everyone who believes Christ Jesus. He has told us, here is a place of rest. Let the weary rest here. This is a place of quiet rest. But they would not listen. Isaiah 28, 12. We must always be quick to ask God to free us from the relentless slavery of sin. Leaning on his strength to never give in to the temptation. God is faithful. But we do get weary. So what are we to do? Well, we can start by taking good care of our body. Exercise, rest, and eat nutritious meals. These activities will help us overcome weariness. Truly, poor nutrition or health habits are just an invitation to burnout. In 2 Samuel 17, verses 28 and 29, we read, They brought sleeping mats, cooking pots, serving bowls, wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans, lentils, honey, butter, sheep, goats, and cheese for David and those who were with him. For they said, you must all be very hungry and tired and thirsty after your long march through the wilderness. Then in 1 Kings 19, verse 5 through 8, we see a great example of trusting, listening, and doing what God requires. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there were beside his head some baked breads and hot st- on, on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. The great prophet Isaiah reminds us of how God works in chapter 40, verse 29 through 31 of his book. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In Ephesians 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul advises, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now there is some really good advice. Wouldn't you agree? Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. The Lord will give us renewed strength when we grow weary. When we come to him in praise, he refreshes our heart. When we come to him in prayer, he refreshes our soul. When we come to him in solitude, he refreshes our body. When we come to him in need, he refreshes our mind. And when we come to him with thankfulness, he refreshes our perspective. And we need this confidence to be released from the burdens of life, drawing our strength from him, the true source of power. So let's ask, when we are tired and when we get tired, what should we do? Our answer will only be found in the word of God. Galatians 6 verse 9 is a good place to start. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Proverbs 30 verses 1 and 2 read, I am weary, O God, 
I am weary and worn out, O God. I am too stupid to be human, and I lack common sense. Job 10, verse 1, Job says he is severely tempted by the, by the enemy. And as he shares, I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. In Ecclesiastes 1, verse 8, Solomon despairs. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. And in Psalm 127, verse 2, we hear, It is useless to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. God gives rest to his loved ones. Hearing all this, we should understand that being tired makes us more susceptible to discouragement, temptation, and sin. And it can cause us to lose hope that things will change in the future. Being tired can cause us to lose perspective. When we're weary, is not a good time to try and make important decisions. Being tired can cause us to say things we may regret later. Ever been there? Sadly, I sure have. Always being tired means we are trying to do too much. It may be God's way of telling us to slow down. Being tired can cause us to lose our vision and purpose. Weariness often makes us vulnerable to our enemies. And when our guard is down, it's easier for them, easier for Satan and his minions to attack us. And they're always ready to do that. So one last question. What's the difference between rest and laziness? Hebrews 4 verse 10 states, For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. But that's at the end. In 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6, Paul warns, Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they they, they receive from us. In other words, if they're not following the truths of Jesus Christ, you shouldn't be following them. And he continues in verse 11 with, yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. Laziness is making excuses for why things can't get done, while rest is a reward for a job well done, and gives you the ability to do more. Proverbs 12 verse 11 assures us, a hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. When leisure becomes the center of our lifestyle, we will find ourselves selfish and lazy, and really need to self-examine and ask, Am I wasting time in the name of fulfilling God's loving command to cease from my laboring for a day? Is this bringing glory to my loving creator? When we know it's time to recharge and focus, that's the time to rest. Let us never make resting a career choice because the Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. Psalm 145.14. Well, now that we have a better understanding of how our loving Father has made the Sabbath for us, just for us, perhaps this is a good time to give some thought to our priorities. Consider these. You're having a very personal and significant conversation with a friend, or you're reading a Bible story with your young children before bedtime. And then the phone rings. What will we, as followers of Jesus, do? Many would answer the phone because interruptions have become top priorities in our culture. Sincerely, doesn't it seem like our lives tend to skip from one urgent interruption to another, all too often causing us to overlook, maybe even ignore, what or who is really important? We need to ask, what are the things, the people, that matter most in life? What are our true priorities in life? And seek the wisdom to honor them. How can we distinguish true priorities from apparent priorities? 
Well, making Jesus our priority determines where we will live forever, but it also determines how we will live now on this earth. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you, James 1.5. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take, Proverbs 3.6. Beloved, friends, work hard, play hard, and take time to rest, giving thanks to God for it all, because he did it all just for us. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for everything, from the breath we breathe, to the work you give us to do, for the Sabbath you ordain. We ask for your wisdom to know when to work, when to rest, and to understand that we can do it all as worship to you, because you did it all just for us. We ask this in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name above all others. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, that is, Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, thank you again for joining me. And if you need prayer or just someone to talk with, or you'd like to discuss this message, please contact me through this YouTube site, and I will get back to you in a timely fashion. And may your week be filled to overflowing with the love of Christ. And may you dance before him until we meet again, whether it be here or in heaven above. May God bless you.